Growing up, I would hear things about curiosity that were mostly negative. The most famous adage that I remember was, curiosity killed the cat. I always took this to mean that sticking your nose where it doesn't belong can be detrimental to your health, both physically and mentally. And certainly in a small town, which is where I grew up, having good boundaries is important. It's an important way to keep from being drawn into somebody else's drama. But I think, really, it has very little to do with curiosity. I've been reminded that the end of that saying is, satisfaction brought him back. Curiosity killed the cat, satisfaction brought him back. And what's true for me is that I never heard that part of the saying until I was in college. I, I guess it means that having one's curiosity satisfied brings the cat back, I guess. That certainly fits more in the way that I think these days. A quick Google search found some other curiosity positive quotes. Here are my top three favorites. William Arthur Ward is credited with saying, curiosity is the wick in the candle of learning. Curiosity is the wick in the candle of learning. I like that one a lot. Zora Neale Hurston, who is actually a famous womanist, said, research is formalized curiosity. It's poking and prying with a purpose. And E.E. E. Cummings said, once we believe in ourselves, we can risk curiosity, wonder, spontaneous delight, or any experience that reveals the human spirit. This brings me back to my childhood. You see, I'm, I'm clear that one of the things missing for me in my childhood was the belief in myself, or belief that I was worthy of love. I think I've mentioned it to you before from this pulpit. And you re may remember that although I'm very different from my family, I, I did not have atrocious parents. I had amazing parents who loved me. I wasn't abused, nor was I bullied. Rather, this belief that I was unworthy of love came from religion. You see, my family of origin was staunchly Lutheran. And as such, it was expected that I would develop a purse a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I went to church every Sunday. I went to vacation Bible school during the summer, and I attended Lutheran youth camp as, as I grew to be a teenager. So I tried really hard. But the relationship with Jesus, it just never manifested when I was growing up. Maybe I had too much of the cynic in me. Maybe I had too much of the heretic. Or maybe I had too much curiosity. Eventually, during my teenage years, I started embracing that curiosity. My boyfriend at the time formalized the concept by encouraging me to explore books, new ideas, and the theater. This kind of curiosity, the kind that encourages exploration, it saved my life in a way. I can say without a doubt in my mind that I would not be the same person if I had not embraced this kind of exploration. I would not live in Berkeley. I would not be married to my husband, and therefore I would not have my two beautiful girls. And I would not be standing in this Unitarian Universalist church, let alone be preaching to you. I came from a large conservative family, and within that system, I was the youngest for 10 years and not taken very seriously. Because of my role as the baby within that family system, and because I often found myself outside of my family's beliefs, I was without a, a voice unless I was touting somebody else's cause. Several years ago, through my employment at Star King School and through a women's empowerment organization called Women Within International, I found my voice, and it led me to seminary. While in seminary, I started the hard work of trying to get real with myself. You know, you can't really minister to others unless you know where your own buttons are. And I discovered that I have a button about being right. Basically, it was the old, not worthy of love belief raising its ugly head again. You see, as a, a youngster, I had decided that there was something wrong with me that prevented me from having a personal relationship with Jesus. I mean, my young mind determined that since Jesus was supposed to be open to all who were serious, and I knew I was serious, the fault had to be mine. So I reasoned I had to find another way to be worthy of love. 
and I concentrated on being useful and being right. Now, being right is basically the opposite of being curious. And over time, I learned to finagle things if I wasn't right. After all, there was a lot at stake for me. Sometimes I'd fib. Sometimes I would kind of blow up the truth. And sometimes I would minimize the truth. But in seminary, I started searching for ways to attend to this aspect of myself. Curiosity stepped in to save my life again. Curiosity became my friend. Now, the first thing that I learned was that approaching differences of opinion with curiosity, rather than explaining why I think that that opinion is wrong, is a helpful tactic. Being genuinely curious is what makes that process really work. The Center for Courage and Renewal talks about it like this. They use the language turning to wonder instead of curiosity, but I think it's the same thing. They say, turning to wonder means questioning the source of our own feelings and actions, such as, what does it mean that I associate these two things? Or, what events in my past have conditioned me to respond this way? In listening to others, turning to wonder also means resisting the urge to react or jump to conclusions. We can ask, what does he really mean when he uses that word? Or, I wonder how she came to believe that. So in other words, when I get curious about something, I examine my resistance rather than the other person's faulty reasoning. Now there's several things that I notice happen with this blueprint. First, in order to look at my resistance, I have to really fully consider what the person is saying. I can't be jumping ahead in the conversation and planning what I'm gonna say in response. Rather, I have to stay present so I get what they're proposing. And I notice that when I open to the person's analysis, when I really hear what they're saying, I find that I'm more open to their perspective. The second is that I find that being curious slows me down because it, it, it takes time to really hear somebody else. If I'm serious about it, it often means clarifying and asking questions. And the third is that it changes the flavor of my relationships. I mean, think about it. What happens when somebody lectures you on the inadequacy of your analysis? I don't know about you, but I tend to pull back. On the other hand, what happens when somebody is vulnerable with you? I lean into those conversations. They're interesting to me. And really, hearing someone requires a degree of vulnerability because you might be changed. Now, I imagine you've heard some of this before. If, if not, I'm not mistaken, I've said some of this before to you. So why am I bringing it up right now? Because I think we're in a scary place within our country. It seems like this country is divided into camps. Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, liberals. Black lives matter, all lives matter. Let's go on and on. And I don't know about you, but my Facebook feed, it seems to be an echo chamber repeating only what I believe. If I'm not careful, I can find myself only having conversations with people that agree with me and screaming matches with everybody else. How many people do you know that truly believe that Donald Trump should be put in jail or worse? How many people do you know that believe he's the best thing since sliced bread? And do these folks converse? And if that example doesn't work for you, pick a different one. How many people do you know that believe that Black Lives Matter is crucial to peace within the United States? And how many people do you know that think it's a total crock? And are they talking to one another? This trend frightens me, and I don't think I'm alone. The reading from Brene Brown speaks to her own concern about how we seem to be losing the ability to discuss. 
Now, I'm going to pause here to make a caveat and a confession. The caveat is this. I stand before you as a white, privileged, cisgendered, straight woman. I understand the privilege that that affords me. I know that African American mothers and fathers cannot afford to go slowly in having conversations about how black lives matter. Their sons, their brothers, their uncles are being gunned down at an alarming rate. There was another one just this weekend. And I know that my role as an ally is to express my outrage, to vote with my body in protesting, and to be aware of how racism in the United States plays out again and again and again. I want to be clear that I'm aware that there are places where slowing down to have a conversation with somebody doesn't feel like it fits because of the unfolding tragedies. Here's the confession. I'm not always sure where the boundary is between in this place I need to be discussing and in this place I need to be protesting. I don't always know. The big things are, are easy for me. You know, kids in cages, yeah, I can get behind protesting. But there are other places where calling Donald Trump names, I don't know. A mentor friend of mine once told me, when things are really murky and difficult, when you're in a situation where you do not know what the next best step is, say what you do know. So this is what I do know. I know that while I cannot completely understand the outrage of people who live at the margins, it is justified. I'm clear about this. I know that the way we have been trying to access change is slow. And I know that what I'm suggesting, suggesting may make it even slower. But this business of being divided into camps is not good. And I've seen throughout the world that when camps are in evidence, it doesn't seem to really matter who's in charge. Because when the other camp comes to be in charge, when they come into power, it often results in yet more carnage. I'm thinking about the civil wars in Rwanda. I know that when people try to fix things by learning about each other and leaning into one another, by really seeing each other and really hearing each other and trying to feel into what it feels like to be the other person, my experience is that that has a better chance of success. I'm thinking here of the end of apartheid in South Africa. I know that as a white person in the United States who is able to see the pain of those at the margins, it's my responsibility to try to help other white folks see that pain too. And standing in my camp yelling at the other side about how wrong they are, it isn't working, folks. I know that the world works better when we stop trying to find either or solutions. And we live into the both and solutions. My experience tells me that both and solutions are less clear, they take longer, and they sometimes evolve. But my experience also tells me that these solutions last longer. Fundamental to all of what I know is the importance of being genuinely curious. I believe the way forward is not only protesting, but is also engaging curiously with those whom we disagree. And being genuinely curious means that I have to be genuinely open to the possibility that there's something more I can learn. I believe our first principle, believing in the inherent worth and dignity of all people, calls us to allow curiosity back into our lives so that we can begin to see those we so vehemently disagree with. We must engage the worthiness of those in the other camp. And I must do this 
even if they cannot return the favor at first. It's what being a Unitarian Universalist is all about. May the curiosity become the first spark that lights our way towards being in conversation with those with whom we disagree. Amen. Blessed be. And I'll shake.